recording now? Yes, just Brilliant. started. So um, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. So this is the third of our uh, chronicles, and this is on uh, the literary, uh, literary scene, really, in Ireland, past and present, and an integral part of uh, a lot of our itineraries that we do for clients, whether it's individuals or groups, uh, incorporate some element of uh, their favourite authors or a favourite period in time that was written, etc. So we're delighted that we have four fantastic people uh, with us today. We have Turtle Bunbury, who um, has written many books, and one of the ones that uh, he's most famous for, especially in Ireland, is a series called Vanishing Ireland. It was a book and indeed a programme, and it was all about the part of Ireland that uh, we don't want to let go of and we still want to remember. And uh, then we also have Simon O'Connor from the Museum of Literature in Ireland. And that's a new museum that opened up. Uh, unfortunately for the timing, it was just a few months before COVID hit. Uh, so a lot of people haven't gotten to see it yet. Mm -hmm. So it's great that we can uh, tell people about it here. And then as well as that, uh, we also have Pat Liddy, uh, who is uh, one of our top guides, as you all know. And uh, one thing as well, apart from knowing a lot about the history of Dublin and uh, literature, and he's a writer himself, but um, he's also one of our experts on Jewish Ireland. And, and then we have Damien Brennan, who's a scholar and author again on Yeats, mm -hmm. uh, William Butler Yeats, and is actually based in Sligo. So what I'm going to do is I am going to just share my screen for uh, just a brief moment. Um, Giovanna, is that seen there? Uh, just one more second. Yes, we can see it now. Brilliant. So just to remind people that we, um, Adams and Butler are a tour operator based in Ireland and we specialize in Ireland and the UK. We do mid to high end, but most importantly, everything we do is customized and we can incorporate whatever theme people want. Also, we always make sure that our clients don't just see and do, but also feel and engage. We're a member of all the top consortia. Um, around the world, travel consortia. We work with both direct customers, but also with all the travel agents. And um, we're also a travel and leisure A-list advisor for Ireland, for Scotland, and for Africa. So we've had that, I think, since uh, 2015, but this is the first year they gave it to us for Africa as well. And then we were very lucky to have won uh, the uh, best travel professionals in Ireland in the Irish Travel Industry Awards in February 2020. And we were runner up as a green small organization because we do try to uh, use a lot of one man bands and one woman bands and you know keep local communities not only uh, surviving but thriving. And then last but not least, we're also mm -hmm. a member um, of ATA, the African Travel and Tourism Association, and we do about 30% of our business uh, to Africa. So I am going to stop sharing and I am going to introduce our first speaker this evening, Turtle Bunbury, um, to talk to us. Good evening. Thank you, Siobhan, um, and good evening all. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here and uh, no, thank you to Siobhan and Giovanna and the whole Adams and Butler team for organising this Merry event. Uh, what else would you be doing on a Friday? Uh, it is a, a rather a, a wild and windy uh, Friday here in my studio in County Carlo, which uh, for those of you who don't know this part of the world, that's down at the sort of foothills of the Wicklow Mountains, not too far from Wexford or Kilkenny or, or Kildare. Uh, it's just getting quite dark now, but outside my window, I'm surrounded by uh, green normally, autumnal trees and in increasingly wet fields at this moment. But there are age monuments galore. Uh, and that's one reason why I am uh, infatuated with history. Uh, always have been. There are just so many fabulous stories out there. History is, after all, the study of everything that's ever happened, starring everyone who's ever lived. It's a big subject um, and it forms the basis for most literature, Irish and otherwise. Um, I actually started off my, my college career as a law student in Trinity College in Dublin, which some of you may have visited. Uh, I found law quite tricky. Um, one day I popped down to the Four Courts in Dublin, which is the sort of central judicial hub in Dublin City, uh, to meet uh, with a judge who was a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, he was asking me about my legal ambitions, and I confessed that I was having some difficulty tuning into uh, the fascinating world of equitable mortgages and torts and such like. 
and that frankly I was contemplating uh, quitting the course and he leaned into the table and he looked discreetly left and right and he said I don't blame you son get out while you can and so I did um, or at least I, I transferred to the history department at Trinity and I've been hopelessly hooked on history since uh, one of my first jobs was to go around Ireland uh, for a, a travel website writing short blurbs about um, all the battlefields and mansions and ruined castles and graveyards and rivers and mountains, all the landscapes um, that I, come, I came across. It was a wonderful job because seeing the landscapes and the buildings and the streetscapes, it gave me such a, a tremendous perspective, a, a visual structure uh, to my understanding of Ireland's unbelievably, it's quite complicated, but always dramatic past. Uh, history is also about human nature, about the human experience and seeing how people have overcome challenges in the past. Uh, and to that end, I've been blessed by another project which Siobhan mentioned, um, which I've been working on since 2000, 20 years now, uh, since myself and uh, James Fennell, who's a, a very old and dear friend of mine and a brilliant photographer, uh, we co-founded the Vanishing Ireland Project. Um, and since in that time, we've interviewed uh, about 300 men and women between the ages of 70 and 108 uh, blacksmiths and saddlers and farmers and fishermen and housemaids and lace makers and publicans, postmen, anyone who could help us to gain a better understanding of uh, the old world, of old Ireland, which is needless to say, a sort of world that is always fading fast. Um, it's a glorious project, a really such a, a joy to have been working on it. It's, it's ongoing. We put out four uh, Vanishing Ireland books. We're very lucky they were bestsellers, so they keep on generating new ones. Um, we have a, a, a Vanishing Ireland Facebook group that has 125,000 uh, members in it, which is quite staggering. But as I said, it's an ongoing project, and I'll be launching a, a podcast version of, of that in 2021, which is also very exciting. Meanwhile, and I'm coming to the end, um, here in this uh, studio, I have been, I'm always flat out researching World War I or the Easter Rising or the, the Great Hunger, Tudor Plantations, the history of whiskey. Uh, there is no shortage of topics to be uh, focusing in on. I'm presently putting the finishing touches on a, on a book uh, about the Irish diaspora, the Irish who've headed off from this island, uh, uh, this island to go around the world. Uh, going back to the very first uh, Irish missionaries who were going into the heart of uh, dark Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire through some of those unbelievably plucky uh, souls who headed to the Americas in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, uh, and indeed the multiple Irish connections past, present and future to the White House. Uh, I didn't realise that uh, I was going to become a historian later in life, but frankly, uh, I couldn't have wished uh, for a more interesting profession. Uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, back to you, Siobhan. On your yeah. muted. Hi. Hi. Uh, you're muted again. Siobhan, you're muted. Yeah, I think the turtle muted me there. Um, so we're going to move on to Simon from the Museum of uh, Literature in Ireland. So Simon. Uh, great, thanks Siobhan. Can, can everybody hear me? Perfectly. Yeah, that, great, okay. I do actually think that's one, of, that's one of the phrases I hear most now throughout the day is can you Simon hear me? muted. Simon, you're muted. <laughs> can you hear me or am I muted? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Um, but uh, God, we'll look back on this, uh, we'll look back on this period now. Uh, and laugh hopefully <laughs> down the line um, it's uh, it's really lovely to be here and uh, and thanks Siobhan and Giovanna for the uh, for for the invite um, my name is Simon O'Connor I'm the director of the new Museum of Literature Ireland um, uh, also called Molly uh, for short uh, and that's located here on St Stephen's Green uh, which is right in the middle uh, of Dublin city and um, the museum opened um, as Siobhan mentioned actually opened September last year uh, so as far as first years in a museum go, uh, this one has been pretty dramatic. Um, actually, after we after we opened, I, I opened another museum with a friend of mine a few years back uh, on the same park, actually, the Little Museum of Dublin. Ah. And 
I didn't and know. I remember mentioning to uh, to uh, to my wife after we opened Molly, I said to her, you know, I don't think I have another museum opening in me. Um, <laughs> and then this week, this week I reopened this museum for the second time. So that's three in one year so far. But um, uh, but we're delighted to be back open. Um, and it's in a wonderful location, as I said, it's right in the middle of Dublin City. Um, and it's in a beautiful collection of buildings. Uh, that originally were home to the biggest university here in, in Ireland, University College Dublin. Um, the houses themselves are um, uh, gorgeous Georgian period houses, um, and they've had a huge amount of writers, Irish writers, have studied uh, within the walls of these buildings. Um, the most famous graduate of, uh, of all was, was James Joyce, and he studied here um, and graduated from the university in 1902. Um, and within our exhibitions, uh, we display, I suppose, the pride of the Irish State's Joyce collections, lots of his notebooks, his original um, kind of scraps of paper that he was writing on. He wrote on literally anything he could find. Um, uh, very kind of unromantic, you know, in a way. Uh, it's not beautiful letter bound uh, writing books. It's like little copy books. He's writing in, you know, multiple crayon colors all over the place. It's nearly indecipherable. Um, you know, the poor publishers that had to, that had to deal with it. Um, but an absolute genius, and I think perhaps rarest and most valuable of all uh, in our museum, visitors can come and look at Joyce's own copy of his novel Ulysses, um, which is probably um, the, the, the most important novel ever written, um, certainly in the 20th century. Uh, and this copy, it's famously referred to as copy number one. It was the copy that was handed to him on his birthday, um, which was the day it was published, the very first copy that came from the printers. Um, Joyce actually had, he had his own uh, graduation photograph taken uh, in our back garden. Um, we have beautiful gardens out the back of the museum uh, and, um, and he had his graduation photograph taken there uh, against a tree that still stands in the garden. Um, he looked really grumpy uh, in the graduation photograph, but I suppose we were all young and, and cantankerous once. Um, a lot of visitors uh, to the museum today often get their photographs taken uh, against, against that tree. We call it the Joyce tree. And the gardens themselves actually are kind of a, I suppose, a silent haven right in the middle of, of the city centre. And they open up at the back into a, a very little known Victorian park called the Ivy Gardens, um, which is an absolutely beautiful 19th century park that most Dubliners themselves um, have never visited. Of course, all of the Dubliners that are on this call uh, have, have visited the Ivy Gardens, I know that. Um, but it's actually, it's, it's often called um, uh, the Secret Garden in Dublin. So um, it's a kind of a beautiful thing for the museum to be connected to and within. Um, now I recently heard, uh, I recently heard Dublin uh, described as a, as a literary campus. Uh, and it struck me as a most fitting description because writers and writing are literally everywhere in this city. Um, so as well, of our, as well as our own museum, uh, the city is full of literary exhibitions, places of interest to visit, like the National Library just down the road from us, um, Sweeney's Pharmacy, which is this kind of wonderfully eccentric Joycean chemists where there are readings happening, you know, all day, every day. That's just a five minute walk from the museum. And um, the wonderful Seamus Heaney exhibition uh, is free and just across the road from Trinity College in the kind of dead center of the city. Um, and then if you're adventurous, the Joyce Tower um, is about 20 minutes from us just along the coast. Uh, so you can go and visit that. Um, and then if you wanted, you could take off all of your clothes and jump into, uh, into what Joyce himself calls the snot green scrotum tightening sea. Um, if that's uh, if that's your kind of thing, I can uh, I can personally attest. I was there with my dad last Sunday, um, and it, uh, it 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 certainly is scrotum tightening. But that's probably too much information uh, for 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 this call. Um, Before nine o'clock in the evening, <laughs> <laughs> is it past the watershed? Um, uh, uh, bookshops, uh, of course, abound the city, um, and thankfully they remain have remained open in most stages of this COVID uh, pandemic. And the city and the country have a huge number of boutique literary festivals running all year, um, which give visitors, I suppose, to the country really intimate access to living writers and opportunities to discuss dead ones as well. Um, living writers are a very big deal for us in the museum. Um, we work with the whole writing community in Ireland um, and we regularly present lectures, readings, interviews, uh, writing classes and other events. Um, a lot of these are online for now. Um, so I suppose we're not getting to stand around drinking cheap wine uh, after readings, um, but that will all come back uh, hopefully in the coming months. Um, so for the book lover, uh, there's literally something to do uh, every night uh, in Dublin. And then for the director of the Museum of Literature, that's basically really exhausting. 
uh, for me, but it's um, but it's a privilege to work in this field, uh, and I think to represent what is truly one of the most literary cities in the world. Um, Dublin has had a host of Nobel Prize winners in literature, um, and was one of the earliest UNESCO cities of literature as well. So every year the city comes together to celebrate a single book uh, and read it together with this with our One City One Book Festival. So that gives you an indication of of how seriously we take this stuff. Um, a final note uh, uh, on 2022, um, uh, so we're all kind of looking to the future now, thankfully, and um, 2022 is the centenary of the publication of Ulysses. So it was published uh, uh, 100 years, uh, uh, nearly 100 years ago in 1922. Um, we ourselves in the museum are planning a huge program of special events um, to coincide with that. Uh, and that those will be joined, I think, by a vast celebration of Irish literature throughout the year at home and abroad. Um, so for literary lovers, I think that will be an especially uh, an especially good time um, to visit the city uh, and uh, and to kind of get really involved in the literary scene and um, sure who knows might even bump into some of you at a reading or even better have a got big literary argument with you over a few pints in the pub um, so uh, so thanks thanks for listening and um, hopefully we'll see you in Dublin sometime soon fantastic Simon can I just ask you um what are when like what's the way at the moment that when do you envisage that you'll be open? Is it by appointment at the moment if people wanted to come? We're back open. We 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 um, museums and galleries actually reopened on Tuesday of this week, um, and it's looking likely that they'll remain open um, in nearly every single uh, nearly every single level apart from the full do lockdown. You have to make an appointment like you do the National Museum to go. Nope. Or you just no, 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 no. Visitors can come on up. Yeah, so we're taking walk-in visitors all the time. Um, and we're open six days a week now, Tuesday to Sunday. Fantastic. Um, so it is something that's very new. There's a lot of comments there, people who didn't know about it before. So we're delighted, um, you know, that we can spread the good news. And it's something, again, that's very Irish. And I even looked at your website and there's an amazing digital um, exhibition on Frederick Douglass when he was in Ireland as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and actually that's a physical exhibition that's just opened inside the inside the mm -hmm. museum. So um, which we um, which we organized with the um, African American Irish Diaspora Network. Um, so Douglas uh, was one of the, uh, I suppose, one of the, the principal figures in the abolitionist movement in the US. Um, and after he wrote his famous narrative uh, of his life, um, he left America um, for a short period and went to the UK and then came to Ireland and was really was really taken with Ireland and um, spent some time with Daniel O'Connell, um, who was a political figure here in orator that, that Douglas really admired um, and actually uh, worked on a second edition of his narrative here that was published in Ireland. So um, to celebrate that visit uh, and the anniversary of that, we um, we, we hosted this this exhibition and um, that's running in the museum actually until February and then it's traveling down to Cork uh, as well. So. Fantastic. So sort of interesting things as well that you wouldn't have expected um, in an Irish literary mu museum, like the different connections, you know, around the world. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's brilliant. Thanks a million, Simon. And thanks a million for joining. Pleasure. So we're going to move on to Pat Liddy, who is another Dubliner. Uh, Pat, you need to unmute yourself there. Right. Born and bred Dubliner. Are we OK now? Pat, uh, just to let you know, the very first comment that came in the chat box was from Mark and Cindy. Yes. And they made the comment, hi, Pat, because you probably didn't see it. We had a oh. walk with you and then we took you to see the train. Took you to see the train several years ago. Do you remember the Belmont train? There, there were two. Uh, I remember. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, folks, for, for your comment. And it's going to be very hard to follow Simon and his bodily functioning tightening and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, and I can also assure him that his cheap wine is is very tasty. I've had it on a couple of occasions, so don't be put off for the fact that he's mean and he he only buys cheap wine. Um, so uh, yes, well we do uh, lots of tours in Dublin and many of them uh, by our own liking and by requests from people are literary tours. They can be general literary tours, uh, dealing with all our great names, whether it's Yeats, uh, Wilde, uh, Joyce that we were talking about, Bram Stoke or whatever, or they can sort of focus so I'm just one of those people. For instance, uh, on the 16th of June, we always do Bloomsday Walks, which of course is based on, on the Ulysses book. 
Uh, but we can do that at any time of the year. It doesn't have to be on the 16th of June. So if anybody uh, loves Ulysses, uh, we can take them to many of the places in Dublin associated uh, and, and appear in the book or associated with Joyce. And uh, we also do tours associated with the book festival again. Uh, that's usually in October, but we can do it at any other time. And you have to remember... There are the great names like the Nobel winners, uh, the literature winners in, in, in the Nobel Prize uh, in Dublin, but there are many other writers, both from times past and contemporary writers, and we can't forget those either. Um, Bram Stoker is maybe even more internationally known than James Joyce. I'm sorry, Simon, but that's, uh, that's just the way it is, especially in places like Russia or China who mightn't yet have read uh, Joyce. And that can make a very, very interesting tour. And of course, we ham it up a little bit. And we do lots of quotations from Dracula, in case you didn't know Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. And uh, there are many opportunities uh, to see places associated with all our great writers. Of course, we would take people in to see Molly, as we call it, the Museum of Literature Ireland, or into uh, uh, places associated with Joyce, or into Sweeney's The Pharmacy, and have the wonderful people, the volunteers inside talk to us and uh, show us the, the different uh, items that are in the pharmacy that have been left behind from years ago, associated with the pharmacy itself or associated with Joyce. Uh, so the streets of Dublin are so welcoming at the best of times. Right now, of course, they're empty, but uh, that's all going to change next year. Um, we're very hopeful that the whole tourism uh, picture will start to open up by uh, March, April, perhaps, and we'll be there uh, to welcome people. So if, if any of you good folks want either a private or to organize a, a private literary themed tour, it doesn't have to be only on literature, but we can slip that into a general tour as well. You've only to let uh, Adams and Butler know and uh, we're there for you uh, to do it um, and to visit places once they're open. But sometimes you have to do tours when places are not open. But we can create all the, the pictures uh, of, of uh, times past when these great people, unfortunately, they were mostly men in the past. The women are beginning to make a mark about time too. But in the past, they were mostly men. But all these great people, uh, they, they, they walk the streets of Dublin and we can walk the streets with them. So I guess that's about it, um, folks, for the moment. Unless you have any questions, of course. So um, that's brilliant. Thanks a million, Pat. I'm just seeing, is there any questions there coming in? Just so we need to ask you whilst you're there. Nope. Um, so we're going to pass on to Damien, but uh, stay around, Pat, in case there's any questions for you. Yeah. And just... Uh, before Damien comes on, just so that uh, I've just put a link for the webinar we're doing on Tuesday. It's on country pursuits and activities in Ireland. So I've just put the link for the registration there uh, that we have next Tuesday. So over to you, Damien. Uh, you're still muted, so I'm going to ask you to... Un oh, wrong person. Um, there I am. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yep, great. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> Hi folks, uh, thank you for being with us. I see we're now up to 80 people and that's very good. That's a great opportunity for us all, all four of us, to Aunt Adams and Butler to present ourselves. I'm Damien Brennan, I'm a Yatesian. Um, I don't often admit this and if I do admit it to 80 Americans, I don't want you to tell anyone, but I'm actually a true born dub as well, Pat. Uh, but I've lived in Sligo here on the Northwest Coast coast of Ireland for the last 40 odd years. My mother is from this county and we live, uh, my wife Paula and I live on uh, the original family farm which we've lived on since 1824. So my roots go deep into the into the AIDS country. And of course the AIDS country is centred on the town of Sligo and um, Simon calls Dublin um, a literary city. Well Sligo is a literary town let me tell you and William Butler Yeats is at the heart of that. He was the first Irish man to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. He won it in 1923. Uh, Dubliner George Bernard Shaw won it in 1925. Oscar, um, uh, bum, 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 um, Beck 
Beckett won it in the 1960s and Seamus Heaney won it in 1975. Uh, Am I right? I think I'm right. And um, uh, but Ari Yates won it all that time back. His connection with Sligo is very deep because it's where his mother's family came from and uh, the, um, the infrastructure with, in which he grew up and the landscape in which he grew up, more importantly, and which informed a great deal of his early poetry is all still intact. So uh, that's, that, that's really invaluable to get a sense of the Yeats country. And then, of course, his brother, Jack Butler Yeats, Yeats the poet, only spent his holidays here. But Yeats, uh, the, um, uh, the Jack Butler Yeats, his brother, who's our most important impressionist painter, uh, he spent uh, seven years here, living here as a child. And he said there was nothing he ever painted, but that there was something in, of Sligo in it. And in Sligo, in the Model Island Centre, we have uh, the largest public collection outside of the National Gallery, and the largest public collection of Yeats, Jack Butler Yeats paintings and his contemporaries. And that becomes a very interesting part of a literary or a cultural tour as well. Uh, for my part, um, like Pat, I take guided tours. Uh, well, two, two things. The first thing is now I take guided tours. I've done lots for Adams and Butler um, at, of groups, whatever size, um, to tour the countryside and the town of Sligo. The Eighth Country is only actually about 30 miles from north to south around Sligo town. And uh, there's lots of lots of interest in it and lots and lots of the poetry. So pretty typically I would meet your clients um, at their accommodation. And as I say that, it's worth saying to you that we have at least two homes open to the, for accommodation in Ireland's Blue Book, uh, both of whom are still run by the Anglo-Irish families who built them in the 1700s. Pretty amazing, marvellous places to stay. And I know Adams and Butler value them as clients as well. And, uh, but I picked your, your, your guests up at- Sorry, Damien, which two are they? Is that Cooper's Hill? Cooper's Hill and um, uh, Temp Temple House. Temple House, okay, brilliant. I don't yeah. know Temple House's Blue Book. I think it's Hidden Ireland, but they are amazing properties. And actually- Sorry? We, they are amazing properties. And we actually have Temple Hill, yeah. uh, Temple House on next Tuesday as well, which is great. All right, great. Yeah, super. Yeah. So um, tell Roderick I said hello. And the, the um, so um, we have really good accommodation for, for clients at the upper end of the market and then lots and lots of middle, middle accommodation to excellent standards. So I picked your client up at half nine in the morning, take them off for the day, don't bring them back home till about half five, by which time, whether they knew anything about Yates, they now know everything about Yeats. And the last thing they need to do is to go and buy a book of Yeats's poetry. They always say, where can I buy a book of Yeats's poetry? And um, the other thing which kind of came together when Simon was talking is that, of course, Yeats Day is celebrated now here in Sligo on the 13th of June. That's his birthday. And Bloom's Day is the 16th. So it, it can be part of a very integral um, 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 literary a uh, focused literary tour for people to come and, and uh, do uh, 10 days over those, those two big dates and find lots of local activity in Dublin and in Sligo uh, to, to make that memorable and to meet local people and to interact at that level. We have a very active Yates Society here. I'm a past president of it and a very uh, important oldest in the world uh, literary summer school in, uh, in, in normal years at the end of July into August. And so there's always some Yates stuff happening. And then we have the Jack Yates piece and then his two sisters, Lily, Lily and Lolly. Some of their work is also in the Model Island Centre. Um, that probably is that other than to say again, um, we have uh, previously uh, entertained people for dinner or for lunch into our home. And um, we have downsized in advance of COVID, but thankfully we've downsized, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, are now offering um, dinner to private groups of 10 or 12, uh, no more than that, but that's pretty typical for what Adams and Butler sent out. Is somebody saying something to me? No, it's just interference, so don't worry. Okay. It came just as the catch in my throat came through. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So we're offering those um, boutique dinners uh, to uh, particular guests, such as Adams and Butler Attract. And I see somebody called Debbie commented. Yeah, I saw it coming up there. Debbie there you are. Nice. This is great. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So we look forward, yes, to a renewal as well. Um, uh, the uh, opportunities are all still here. Ireland is still here. It's still, as, um, as uh, Simon started out by telling us, it's still wild and windy, I can tell you. But Sligo is at the heart of the wild Atlantic way, which is a guided or signposted tour route said to be the longest in the world. It goes from North Donegal right down to um, Cork and Kerry. And I suppose finally, Siobhan, I just used the Kerry word. So maybe I'll get some of them out of their agony by saying that, yes, I am a Brennan. And those brothers in the Park Hotel are richer than I am. So uh, that's the Park Hotel in Kenmare. And uh, I'm the oldest and the poorest, Pat. Don't laugh. You're looking at decrepitude. Okay. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Siobhan, for giving us this opportunity. And thank you, the other panellists, for letting me go last. Brilliant. Thanks a million there. Um, just um, if someone could help me. Um, Somerville and Ross, the name of the house that Tom Somerville lives in. I was there last month and I've forgotten the beginning with the D. Not Drina, what do you call it? Uh, Drishan. Drishan. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, Drishan. Yeah, yeah Drishan. So there's a, a lady there looking uh, to know about Somerville and Ross, and you can actually visit the house. I was there myself um, a month ago, and they will do private tours. You can go there for dinner. They actually have uh, cottages as well in the courtyard that you can stay in. So, um, like, the thing is, like, even now when you see the comments, there's so many, you know, literary connections all over Ireland that are fantastic. So no matter what part you fall into, um, you know, they, they you can you can always find some connection there. And uh, Joe has... Together, just, yes, I was just going to mention that I've We've put together a sample itinerary of something we can do, but we can do uh, so much more or many different things. So um, I just put in the chat box there just an idea of an itinerary we could do uh, based in literature. Uh, but again, if you have requests or if your clients are interested, um, there's a lot of other things that we can do as well. And just um, if Richard, my son, now was on uh, this webinar, he would be able to tell you as well, you can actually rent out Drishan House to stay in. Uh, you can take the main house. Not only can you stay in the, the cottages in the courtyard, but you can actually rent out the main house as well. So I've just oh, put it Can you spell the name of the house there and just write it on the chat? Correct me. It's D-R-I-S-H-A-N-E, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Thurdo. And what's the name of the little village? Because it has that amazing restaurant in it. Um, Castle Carberry. No. No. Uh, no. Castle. Townsend. Castle Townsend. Thank you. Um, and I went uh, actually kayaking in the uh, moonlight there as well. It's it's an amazing amazing place to visit. Um, and minimum number of nights. There's never a minimum number of nights. You just if you want to stay one, you just pay for two or three. So you know there's ne did never worry about a minimum number of nights. Can you type? Can I, can I help you with that for a moment, Siobhan? You sure. In what way? Well, in this way, that the most memorable group you ever sent to me, and you'll remember who they were, were six America, uh, New York-based college students, and uh, they flew in on a Friday. They oh. did an amazing itinerary, it had helicopters and things, and they were mm. back in college on Monday morning in Manhattan before anybody knew they had gone. I talk about it all the time. It was an incredibly clever itinerary, and they were very bright people. Well, One I of them... Yeah, I'm, I must have to say, uh, one of them was actually the son of one of our top clients. And that's right. Yeah. He's a very, very gracious young man because I met him in Ballyfin about six months later. And we passed right. him on the stairs. And um, he uh, said to um, so he was traveling with, he said, This is the wonderful lady who introduced my mother to Ireland or something. And I thought, My God, a young man coming out with stuff like this. They were amazing. He spoke Irish Gaelic to me the whole way around. I know, and he speaks Russian as well. Yeah, I actually yeah, talk South yeah. Irish. It's amazing. Like, you know, there are so many young people out there that are just astounding. And, you know, it's wonderful hope for the future when we have people like that. Um, okay, it was Castle Townsend, wasn't it? So I'll write that in there. Um, if there's any other questions that anyone... I just wanted asked, to add as well that um, Turtle can do a lot of genealogy stuff as well for us. Do you want to just briefly touch on that, Turtle? Oh, 
there you Sorry, go. I, I'm, I think I'm back on there. Yeah, great. Uh, well, uh, yes. I mean, I'm 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 always uh, fascinated by people's uh, ancestry, family stories. Um, I've been involved in something called the Genealogy Roadshow, which they now have on PBS uh, in the US, uh, but they had it on on Irish television for a little while. Um, and um, yeah, it's basically going back in time and tracking down, um, going back as many generations as you can to try and find where people's forebears came from is always uh, an intriguing, uh, sometimes complicated, sometimes impossible, uh, but um, yeah, always a fascinating thing to, to get involved in. So I do uh, an element of that and have done with uh, uh, plenty of lovely Adams and Butler's uh, clients before. Um, so it's, uh, it's a world that I enjoy. Yeah, I remember when you had um, six O'Neill brothers uh, meeting yeah. at the O'Neill pub. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They got to a pub called O'Neill's. They were, as you say, six brothers uh, who had all united, hadn't seen each other for a very long time. Uh, I have to say, I did have quite an itinerary of Dublin lined up for them. But when they got to O'Neill pub and they ordered six pints, uh, and then there was another six pints that followed that, and I think possibly a few more after that. So uh, the itinerary was somewhat shortened, but we still uh, managed to talk all about the O'Neills for uh, for a, a, an hour or two, a really fun afternoon. But that's the thing as well, like we can do a serious genealogy tour or we can make it more enjoyable and entertaining because at the end of the day, if family are traveling and trying to catch up with roots, it's a brilliant time to also catch up with themselves. And uh, now post COVID, we see a lot of what we see as almost family regatherings where, you know, people were sequestered in different parts of the world or different parts of the country. And they're planning a trip next year and all getting back together again. So it's really, really lovely. Um, but like that, any theme can be incorporated, anything, you know, everyone in Ireland is flexible. Like, you know, if, if we have an itinerary, it's very rarely we, we follow it according to the letter. I would say we follow our itineraries maybe 2% of the time because uh, we let life and fun take over um, because you know you're on a vacation you're not an endurance test and um, so I think like when you hear everyone's stories about our clients you you realize that uh, you know it's very flexible and it's very much um, to make sure that they go home with those cherished memories when they're here yeah I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that um, that is part of the the thing about coming to Ireland is you have to kind of go off piste and go down uh, unexpected roads and roads you really didn't mean to to get down and that's where sometimes you find the best crack and the best fun so yeah I'm totally agree with you Siobhan. So I'm going to put in an email address if anyone wants more information and we'll be sending out a recording as well to everyone. Um, so there's the email address if anyone wants more information. And uh, as I said, a recording will be going out to everyone who registered as well as the people who attended because we get a lot of people who also register so that they get the recording later if they can't make the time. So and if, if anybody wants to ask a question to one of the presenters, you can unmute yourself um, and just ask the question there. We've got a few minutes. Everybody's shy today. But right. lots of lovely comments there, lots of things, with, uh, lots of comments in the chat box. So thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, I, I would ask Damien, what's your house that I went to, I think, eh, with an Irish fam? You, you came with, to visit Brock House, B-R-O-C. Yes, and, that was an and and exactly. We have, and um, that's the Gaelic for a badger. We have lots of badgers in the fields around here. But since then, we downsized <laughs> and built a house right next door called the Dove House, and that has a table that will take 10 or 12. If you remember when you came to us, you probably were in a group of 20 or 24 or some such, uh, but we can sit 10 to 12, and we're happy to sit only four uh, if, if it's to make an evening out of it, and we can always introduce, introduce some local people of character and fun uh, to make it a local evening dinner party. So we're very flexible, and again, as people have been saying, it's always great fun. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Siobhan? Yeah, just to remind everyone to tune in again next Tuesday when we have a full length webinar and we'll be covering a lot of activities. Actually, just going to see if I have them all there. Uh, Geo can help me out. Fishing, shooting, equestrian, yoga. We've an 
interesting guy who works with seaweed in Kerry and he does ceviche, Irish ceviche. And he even makes cutlery out of kelp, which I think was it the Sheen Falls had ordered or one of the properties had ordered. And um, we also have hiking, cycling, the Greenway, uh, falconry, uh, horses and hounds. Am I missing anything, Gio? The equestrian and As the hiking. Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. So uh, that'll be good as well. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Siobhan. And thanks to all the presenters. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, thanks Siobhan. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.